We're back today for some follow-up questions from the webinar, Get Your Records Retention Schedule Under Control and Keep It That Way, a case study in global retention scheduling. We're joined again by subject matter expert, Warren Beal. He's the senior sales engineer at Zazio Enterprises and Jed Chadband Massengill, who's a senior analyst at Zazio, as well as Greg Dinklenberg, who's the associate director of records and information management at PRA Health Sciences. Welcome back everyone. Glad to be here. Thanks, Sam. And Happy New Year. Yes. So let's get right into the questions. Uh, we have quite a few to get through. And again, thank you so much for being here to do this. Um, question one is, how do you know your retention schedule is too complicated or overly simplified? So the both both ends of this, the spectrum there. Um, Warren, do you want to take us, take us, get us started with this one? Sure, be glad to. Um, I think the best way to answer that is, simply does it work you know can you find the uh, record categories you're looking for do you get a lot of questions you know do you have users calling or emailing you a lot to find out you know where does this fit in the in the schedule if you get a lot of that it's probably not quite sufficient either you've made it too broad or too uh, too granular um, so it's ma mainly sort of a functional question I would say is the best way to describe it okay and, and Greg, just as a, as a practitioner working in the field, uh, is, that, is that your uh, sense as yes. well? I mean, if you make it too complicated, then it won't be followed, so. Mm -hmm. or, you're, or you're barraged with questions every single right. day. Right, exactly, the, every the, day. The RIM person or IG. So what <clears throat> we talked about this a little bit in the webinar uh, last month. Um, what is the sweet spot sort of for the number of record categories? I mean, roughly, I, every organization is of course different, but is there a rough sweet spot range? Yeah, that's it's it's obviously subjective, and it depends on your organization and depends on your industry. But mm -hmm. typically, uh, I'd say that in that 100 to 200 range is pretty uh, you know pretty well accepted as where you want to head. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jennifer, you probably have uh, a lot more experience with that as far as what's uh, worked for you in terms of actually creating those schedules. But that seems to be what I've seen anyway. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right, Jen? I, I think that sounds right, Warren. Yep. Mm -hmm. So our next question is related uh, to this sort of number of categories and different types of approaches. What is your opinion on the, the so-called big bucket approach and setting a retention period that covers the most jurisdictional uh, requirements? And I know that for a while there was a, there, there has been a push to some, some, some very big bucketing. So I'd like you to mm -hmm. touch on both of those points if you would. Uh, can you talk about that a bit, Jen? Yeah, absolutely. So we are really of the mindset that big bucket is kind of best practice for the industry. And that kind of circles back to this idea of um, the simpler, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so with a bigger bucket, you know, functional, functionally designed retention schedule that covers most of the jurisdictional requirements, you know, the benefit is that there is more administrative ease um, mm -hmm. for the retention schedule and then plethora of benefits also for end users. It's just easier for them to use and understand. Can, a, can buckets get too big though? I mean, there's, can you oversimplify and try to- Sure, yeah. There definitely has to be a balance struck there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the things that we're always thinking about are event triggers. You know, the, the natural life cycle of records, mm -hmm. they really, um, you know, kind of speak to unique event triggers and those really do have to be taken into consideration. Um, and then also something we're, all, we're thinking about is kind of striking the right balance with retention periods. Um, if you go super big bucket, what you're gonna end up doing is going with really long retention periods and there could be too much over retention there, um, mm -hmm. exposing the company to too much risk. And then there's also privacy considerations. So I think it's definitely mm -hmm. striking the right balance um, for, for each client. Well, that's that's great. Um, here's a, a curious one. Um, uh, any tips when your IT department asks for 10 to 12 retention policies or periods when automating an electronic platform, something like SharePoint, uh, when a user uh, can choose an applicable schedule and they only want to present, say, 10 to 12 choices? Any thoughts on that? Warren, do you want to lead with that one? Sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, from the outset, my thought when I saw that one is, um, you know, is IT driving your retention schedule or is it the policy? And I think right. that's an important consideration. But, you know, thinking about some of the interactions I've had with our customers, I think what's really driving that is that um, someone in IT is probably aware that if you give users too many options, they, they will likely choose the mm -hmm. wrong one or it's just going to get complicated. So they're really trying to just narrow the choices, which is really what 
uh, is sort of the driver behind departmental schedules. Mm -hmm. You want to say, well, for this department, here's all you need to know about. Um, and that helps the user. And so it's again, sort of finding that balance between uh, you know, the functionality and the, the administration of the schedule and how you implement it for the users. And realistically, that might be possible if you've if you've streamlined your schedule and you know within a single SharePoint environment, you might be able to to restrict mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and we have seen sort of hybrid situations where you have a functional schedule that has everything, but then in certain contexts, you can say, well, we're only going to display these record categories for this group mm -hmm. uh, if that's all that they need. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, I think another takeaway, just again, to emphasize the point that you started with, that it should be the policy that's driving it. Uh, yeah. not, not, uh, not IT. It's uh, sort of, that was, seems a little backwards. Um, so um, our archives, I think this is when we asked actually during the session, but just for completeness, let's get it in here. Are our archives part of the stakeholders in the interview and research process? I would, yeah. I would think hopefully they, they should be. Yeah. Uh, we don't want them to, to feel left out for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, part of that, that interview process is really making sure that you have an understanding of um, what records you're keeping, your mm -hmm. company is keeping, kind of where they are, how, you know, how they're being maintained, et cetera. Um, so certainly archives should be part of that process mm -hmm. and it's always changing, you know, mm -hmm. um, so that their records are, are, are always changing as well. Uh, it related sort of to this is, uh, you know, how is historical defined? Jen, you, can you yeah. talk about this a little? <clears throat> sure, sure. So, you know, as part of that kind of formal appraisal process with records, um, I think what our clients are looking for when they're trying to decide whether something is historical, really it's looking towards these original source records that are really important mm -hmm. to kind of the identity, the brand, you know, the evolution, um, you know, the story of the company. Uh, so maybe it's like an, an original patent or, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a um, kind of a landmark marketing um, campaign, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is kind of during that appraisal process and their value really is kind of intrinsically that it is historical. It's not business, it's not operational, it, there's not a legal basis for keeping those. Um, it's just really important for the company's story. So uh, this next one is, is interesting too about the related to the, the types of schedules you see. Are you seeing any um, variable structure schedules? And they're explaining this as where the record uh, type numbers are assigned uh, on the fly uh, based on specific characteristics. Uh, such as a combination of numbers, uh, you know, that they're very high and uh, it says, but only a small set of categories need to be maintained. Mm. Have you seen, I haven't, I haven't seen this where I've, I've, anywhere I've worked personally. I can't say that I have, but I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, I'm interested. Um, I mean, I think on, uh, on its face, it, it sounds more complicated than, than simple, but I mm -hmm. probably want to get more familiar with it. Um, but I can't recall anything. Warren, are you, does this ring a bell for you at all? Have you seen um, anything like this? It sounds a, in a way uh, like a, um, a file plan structure mm -hmm. uh, in more of the, the older form where you had, uh, say, open filing, uh, open shelving, where you had to perhaps color code the files so that mm -hmm. you could easily uh, retrieve them and locate them. And so the, the numbering scheme would refer to their location or their content or the year. Um, it's sort of in the same uh, the same vein as that. Um, it's it's not as necessary these days with the ability to do searches you know, on a mm -hmm. computer, and so we don't find that as prevalent even in the the filing realms as much anymore. So you're seeing this as a, the carry carry over more from the physical record space. I think yeah, right. it seems to relate to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question here is the next one is could you please define the evergreen approach and provide an example? And and I think I was the one who used the term evergreen, uh, and what I meant was instead of uh, waiting for your your uh, retention schedule to get out of um, out of kilter, to get out of date, to continually update it. That's what I meant by that. Uh, and and that doesn't necessarily mean what you're publishing to people, but you know, keeping the references, the citations um, up to date, making sure you know anything that's going to affect one of your categories and your retention periods um, for your next publication. But Warren, can you talk a little bit about this 
Yeah, uh, I think um, I understand that term just in, in the sense that you're always keeping it up to date versus saying, well, we're going to um, create a schedule and it's going to be static for a year or two. It's a matter of just always keeping up to date with regulations, with um, changes re uh, that are requested from users. Uh, you know, it's sort of just keeping it as a living document rather than thinking of it as a distinct mm -hmm. publication point that you do maybe on an annual or semi-annual basis. And those things can can be separated, the sort of keeping mm -hmm. the, the material up to date so that you're on top of it, aware of anything that's that's relevant to your organization, and then the, the separate publication, the sure. operationalizing it. So those things can be two distinct steps. Um, so, um, how often? This is, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, I think this varies for every company. But general question of how often should a schedule be reviewed as best practice? And so, leading off of that last one, I think that, um, you know, if you have the capability to have a kind of service that is continually giving you updates on citations, uh, I think that's in my in my mind that's that's the highest level of maturity an organization can be at, so that they're they're on top of it all the time. Um, but certainly, I think there there are um, acceptable, uh, you know, good practices uh, somewhere that that aren't as continuous as that. Um, do uh, Jen, would you like to comment on that one? Um, I'm sorry, Anne. Can you repeat your question? So it's just how often uh, should? Sorry, I did ramble in there to an answer. So um, how often <laughs> should a schedule be reviewed as best sure. practice? So I think okay. there's, a, there's a range of what is really, you know, really good practice. Then there's optimizing. So sure, I think sure. I was saying that doing it continuously, doing taking an evergreen approach is more like that optimizing yeah. end of the spectrum. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think, you know, um, first of all, this is kind of governed by the, pol you know, your, mm -hmm. your organization's policy. And I think when they're looking, um, our clients, you know, internally, and they're looking at, you know, what, what's an appropriate, um, you know, period of time, as far as, you know, our refresh goes, um, they're thinking about things, uh, you know, such as, you know, what jurisdictions are we operating in? What's the regulatory mm -hmm. nature of those jurisdictions? Um, you know, do they have really aggressive um, oversight? Also, just, you know, the industry in general, um, how mm -hmm. heavily regulated is the industry? So I think we find that our clients that are really he heavily regulated are refreshing on a more, you know, frequent basis, mm -hmm. and that really fits their risk profile. So mm -hmm. um, I think typically what we see is um, annual, every one to three years, three years being on the longer side. Right. Um, of course, for some really minimally regulated clients, we will see five years. So it just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a combination of sort of their, their risk profile, but also internally, but also externally with, with respect to the kind of market that they're in. Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, can someone give an example or two of state laws limiting a retention period for a type of record? Jen, I have you tagged on yes. this. Yes. Yes, I would love to, to provide some examples. So, um, <clears throat> you know, these are always kind of, I think, with what we do and, and um, without, you know, I'm a little nervous to sound super nerdy here, but we love finding these types of requirements, you know. Um, so I'll just provide a couple examples. What we're seeing is, of course, we see a lot of them internationally, but let me just share. Um, oh, yeah, the, the, the question was about state laws anyway. So um, mm -hmm. a great one, I think, is um, the Illinois law that we've seen. So it's a maximum kind of retention period, no longer than three years, um, you know, after kind of last um, um, contact or um, with the individual with regard to like biometric information. Mm -hmm. So um, there's actually been class action lawsuits based on this, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, collecting fingerprints for, you know, individuals checking in for their job and keeping those for too long. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an example right there. And we do have clients that, um, you know, have, have um, made decisions for the retention schedule based on this law. I think another good example um, would be, and this is kind of a, a sneaky one, but Utah has a law which requires um, recruitment records collected to be retained for no longer than two years after mm -hmm. Um, you know, that hiring decision or last contact with the individual that was applying for a position. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's kind of a sneaky one there. And similarly, you know, we've had clients that have made retention schedule decisions based on that law. So there's a lot of them, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. No, that's great. Um, could we elaborate for a little bit on what we talked a little bit about this uh, interview process to sort of understand what your your current situation is? Can you elaborate a little bit? 
more on that interview process, Maureen, and, and then also tell us um, what are some of the important questions that you'd like to ask stakeholders when you do that? Sure. Um, yeah, so we're obviously not referring to, a, you know, interview for a job, but uh, mm -hmm. it's more about interviewing stakeholders. So if you are developing a retention schedule or revising a, a retention schedule, it's important to find out from the source what records are being kept, mm -hmm. uh, what the nature of them are, how they're um, being managed, um, how long they're being kept currently, um, you know, who's generating, who's storing, et cetera. So it involves a lot of different metadata points about uh, the records that are being kept. And so um, there's a lot of decision-making that goes into the process of developing a retention schedule when it comes to, well, who do we interview and how many people do we need to talk to in order to make sure that we get a good uh, cross-section of information? You know, do we talk to just managers? Do we talk to the individual record holders? Um, and so that's a really important process. And it can be a combination of not only interviews, but also surveys. So you mm -hmm. might send out surveys, say, in a spreadsheet or a web form uh, to ask questions about what records are keeping, and then follow up with interviews to fill in gaps or get clarification mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah, I, I would imagine that's that is an iterative process because you don't know yeah. what you're going to encounter when you before you do that first round right. of interviews. Um, next one is how many um, countries do you cover? Uh, and and uh, I think I have a, a broader question, sort of how many how many jurisdictions generally too, not just countries. Yeah, so um, I did just uh, check in our system uh, today prior to this call, and uh, we currently have 139 countries uh, for which we have citations. Mm -hmm. Um, that's broken out to 163 jurisdictions uh, outside of the U.S., meaning that some countries will have uh, provinces or states, and we break mm -hmm. those out in some cases, not in all cases, because uh, mm -hmm. it's not always necessary. Uh, but that just gives you an idea of you know, the breadth of the, the coverage that we currently have. So thanks to our, our legal research team, which Jen is a part of as well. Great. Um, and this one's for Jen. Uh, do citations, uh, do the citations, the legal research that, that you can have done as a service, do they include GDPR, CCPA, and ISO record keeping requirements? I think, mm -hmm. I, think I know the answer to the first, first two. And <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so definitely GDPR, not only at the supranational level for the European Union, the GDPR itself, but also all of the kind of iterations that the member countries have implemented, you know, those are laws that we're capturing. CCPA, definitely. ISO, um, yes. Um, you know, it, it's kind of, um, you know, one of those circumstances, I think ISO as well is, you know, it's, it's proprietary in nature. It does have mm -hmm. some record keeping requirements. Um, and we've kind of had clients come to us and say, hey, here's, you know, here, here it is. Can, can we get this, can, you know, enter it in and can you consider it, provide recommendations based on that? Um, so we have captured um, some of those, um, those ISO requirements and we do consult on those as well. Okay. Um, this one's an interesting one. I think that, that shows uh, sort of, I think an underlying common misconception about uh, retention schedules. Um, in a comprehensive schedule, would all schedules have a legal citation or can you have schedules without a legal requirement was the question. Warren, do you wanna take this one? Sure, yeah, and that's actually a pretty interesting one. Um, you know, the numbers that I've heard is, is somewhere around 40 to 60 percent of the items in a schedule can have an actual legal requirement. Mm -hmm. So as you can tell from that, um, sometimes the majority of your records actually are just based on business requirements, you know, mm -hmm. your own internal requirements for, you know, audits or just keeping things for your own records. Uh, so operational you know, often, considerations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's often thought that the majority have some sort of legal, legal requirement uh, or maybe everything is just seven years, but you know, that's usually not the case. Um, in fact, I'd be curious to know, uh, Greg, from your, uh, you know, your field experience, uh, how that plays out in your, a particular environment because I'm just kind of throwing out some some random numbers not random but you know average numbers so I'm curious if that's uh, if that rings true in your world um, to a certain extent we are pretty heavily regulated in most of what we do so we do have citations but there are some that we actually use uh, industry best practice for so mm -hmm. we'll just we'll we'll create a citation that we can track and and it would be more for best practices mm -hmm. you know, what the business wants. Mm -hmm. And it's, I guess, on those too that you would have some some more wiggle room from from uh, the perspective of bucketing a little bit more easily, as well. Right. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. 
so once you have this one's for you again, Warren. Uh, once you have simplified and man, uh, simplified and managed schedule, how do uh, users apply the schedule to document uh, to documents and to automate deletion? Uh, so yeah. this, is, this is the operationalizing part. That's the sixty-four thousand dollars question, or maybe it's a million now. I don't know, but it's um, <laughs> yeah, and you know, some of that will depend on uh, the size of your organization, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the the number of applications you have in play. Mm -hmm. I would say, by and large, most people right now are just applying them manually. So they are you know, developing the retention schedule in you know, either a tool like ours or in a spreadsheet, and then you know, once it's published or or approved. They will manually go update, uh, you know, various systems that have retention capabilities, um, and that's the typical way that it's done. But outside mm -hmm. of that, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, elevate the level of automation for our customers in the mm -hmm. sense that um, through APIs or through database integrations, we want to basically make it so you have one place to manage the schedule, and then when you publish that, the, the other systems are automatically updated through these uh, APIs or these connectors, mm -hmm. essentially, so that um, if the tool that you have documents in has retention capabilities, then let's try to automate that retention update so you're not having to manually do it. Because as you can imagine, if you are not um, pushing those retention schedules out to the various systems, then your level of compliance is really in question. You know, how, mm -hmm. uh, how effective is the update? How often is it being done? Are you checking mm -hmm. in on it? Uh, all those factors can really reduce the level of compliance if you're not getting all those updates out. Uh, in a in a timely manner, and that manual, if you're doing it manually, that can be an incredibly heavy heavy lift. Sure, yeah. I mean, if you've only got ten applications, that's that's not too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you've got you know a hundred or two hundred, I've I've got customers who have you know twenty five hundred to three thousand applications that they're managing. So mm -hmm. not all of those, of course, will have retention capabilities. But if even a you know a third of them do, that's a lot to manage. That's a lot, and it's a it's also a lot to take off your a lot to take off your plate if you if yeah. you can. So that actually, I think you've covered two of the next questions, which were about those connectivities. Um, so is there anything you can do with the schedule of that? Sorry to to help people. This is, I think, operationalizing from a personal uh, perspective, communications and change management to um, help people bridge the gap between recognizing the categories in the schedule that relate to their data in their system. So do you have any tips basically on on how best to educate uh, the, the end users? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's really sort of a mapping process that has to happen there. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that um, is a matter of uh, kind of going back to how you design the schedule. In other words, does it functionally match what people recognize and be able mm -hmm. to uh, search on the right terms in order to find it? Um, but I would also say that uh, part of that goes back to maybe one of the fundamental things, which is in the very beginning, it's often uh, a good practice to do a data inventory mm -hmm. and be able to map the inventory of all your systems and your repositories back to the retention schedule. And if you can create a link in that retention schedule to those systems, that's even better. So if you look mm -hmm. up you know, those uh, employment applications and be able to have a reference in your retention schedule to say, oh, well, we store those in these three different systems or on the mm -hmm. share drive, wherever it might be, uh, that makes it a lot easier for people to know um, where and how to apply those retention policies. Mm -hmm. So some, some more targeted educational training for the specific users, so. And some additional yeah. metadata points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the next one is, uh, do you recommend setting up a, a master set of retention schedules to capture retention periods by function and then break those down by program. And I think what this person, they, we were trying to figure out specifically what this, this question was getting at, but I think it's the, the discussion of, uh, you know, what's the best approach, functional, a functional approach, department or program approach. And again, some of those terms may be different within a specific organization. Uh, Jen, can you tell us what, you, what your thoughts are, what you've seen out there? Um, and if you have any, you know, particular thoughts on, on like perceptions of which is easier from, from what perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think what we have seen is, um, you know, as some of our clients are kind of getting up to speed and coming to us and asking for help, you know, we, they're saying we want to transition from this mm -hmm. massive departmental schedule to functional. We go through that process. And of course, there is, um, you know, a, a huge kind of learning um, curve mm -hmm. for end users. This is a completely 
new kind of concept. It's organized different. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a training component to make that mm -hmm. to make that retention schedule successful. But what we've also seen is as a way to kind of bridge that gap is that, you know, there's kind of methods, I think, to provide some extra end user guidance. Mm -hmm. While we don't want to kind of revert back to departmental and break anything out or duplicate anything, mm -hmm. um, you know, within the schedule, you know, there's definitely, for example, fields within our software, we can tag different business areas where a record series is relevant or a function is relevant. You know, you can limit views so that, you know, people in different business areas, for example, can only see accounting tax and, um, you know, HR. Um, mm -hmm. So th those are the only areas that are relevant for them. So I think that there's mm -hmm. some, you know, different approaches. We can still keep that functional schedule, but provide some guidance that, um, you know, that will kind of be specific for those business areas and help them really hone in on the areas of the retention schedule that's relevant for them. And Greg, I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this, what, what you, from a practitioner perspective, what, what works best from, from, from your sense? I mean, both as a practitioner, the person implying this schedule, but also, um, you know, in terms of questions you receive, do you find one approach or another better? We decided to go by function in mm -hmm. some cases process. So mm -hmm. uh, a records retention schedule could contain <clears throat> as, um, more than just one department, right? So um, I, I find that by doing it by process and, and or function that you can kind of find where the records are generated easier than mm -hmm. just by a department, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. And this one's also this one. I while I have you on the hook here, just this one also is for you. Um, is it possible to manage a global retention schedule on your own? So you have you have a you have a big one to manage, or several, I think, right? Uh, so, do you think can you do it on your own? Is this a something a one man operation? Well, I know we couldn't. Um, you know, doing business in in over eighty countries would be pretty uh pretty crazy and i guess it depends upon what you mean by on your own right mm -hmm. does that mean no tools uh like um like as for instance like a zazio right mm -hmm. um if, if that's the case and all you have is the internet i i put in uh a search that said how long to retain employment records in brazil right so you know mm -hmm. what's your retention period for employee records it was, i came mm -hmm. back with 203 million hits so imagine one title for one function and having to parse through all that mm -hmm. what's legitimate what's not you know what have you and then keeping it up to date mm -hmm. and then do your day and then do your day job right so right. and that's no, the, that's you, like that's many many people's <clears throat> full-time day jobs right 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 yeah so yeah unless you have an army of folks doing this mm -hmm. for you no i i you need some kind of tool mm -hmm. to, to to work through this yeah, and I, I, that's that has been my personal experience that it rapidly gets out of hand for one person to do it. And it's not just a question of the, it's a question of both the expertise in that particular jurisdiction as well as uh, language barriers. Um, right. So here's an interesting one um, uh, that I think some of us, I'm sure you've encountered this with clients who are doing this and I've, I've encountered it myself. Um, if you have to work off of an Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> any tips? Uh, to be sure you stay up on top of departmental updates um, when doing an inventory for the enterprise, or you know, how, how do you manage a records retention schedule basically in Excel? Warren, <laughs> thoughts on that? <laughs> well, well, we chuckle, but I would say uh, you know, ninety percent of the yeah, yeah. prayer certainly helps. Yeah, really. Ninety percent of the of the the organizations that we work with um, start that right. <laughs> they start that way, or they're still doing it that way, even if they're you know global international mm -hmm. uh, companies. Um, just because it's it's a simple format that everybody understands, it's it's mm -hmm. recognizable, and you know to be honest, it works quite well if you have a, a relatively small schedule. You know it's mm -hmm. easy to to sort and, and search and function and filter mm -hmm. and so forth. But once you get into those international scopes, it becomes just so unwieldy because mm -hmm. trying to cross reference the uh, you know, the, the various record types with the different exceptions, you end up with multiple spreadsheets or at least multiple worksheets and trying to, to navigate between those becomes uh, just very unwieldy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it can be done and it's done all the time. It's just not very efficient and you have issues with being able to share the spreadsheet. Uh, does it get corrupted? Does somebody update it when they're not supposed to? Uh, which version is the correct version? 
do you have an audit trail of, of who changed what? Um, all of those things, when you start to look at it, become very problematic when it comes to being compliant, uh, facing audits, uh, all of those issues that you, know, you, you deal with as a multinational organization or even a mm -hmm. you know, small organization. Mm -hmm. So our next two questions are about specific retention periods. Um, so does anyone have a record retention on social media or texting? How long do you keep? And how long do you keep need to keep hard copies and digital? And I, um, so my immediate thoughts on this are that it shouldn't be based on the medium, but the, the content. Uh, and you know what what is it? Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? I'll throw that one to Jen. I think you've probably dealt with it more than I have, uh, at least in terms of the uh, the retention yeah. periods, Jen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, fundamentally you go to that question about you know what is the content. Mm -hmm. um, I think more so what we see our clients doing and we recommend is really try to control this by policy as much as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, you really want to keep kind of substantive business records off of social media or texting or, you know, your BYODs or your collaboration sharing platforms. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so um, policy really, I think, provides really great guidance for, um, you know, end users. And then really the idea is that anything that would be subject to the retention schedule is kind of saved um, separately mm -hmm. and in accordance with the records retention schedule. Going back to that that content. So keeping some of those those you know chat functions and things like that for the the chatting sort of capability right. that they're they're meant to be. Don't conduct business on them, <clears> and, <throat> and then enforce that so that you right. can you can employ uh, it would be able to deploy a, a a shorter retention period. And I think that goes also you know with the hard copy and digital. One of the issues there is just sort of you know what what is that hard copy? There may be instances in which you can get rid of it if you've made an appropriate conversion to to digital. Um, but in other cases, you might need to keep it. But again, I think it depends on the content of the record and what your policy is, uh, mm -hmm. why you're keeping that record. Um, so the next question here is, uh, does anyone know where I could find an example of retention schedule for financial services and credit unions? And I, I, I'll just take a quick uh, point on that is there there are often industry groups out there uh, certainly for the pharma pharmaceutical and biotech industry there there are uh, groups and I believe there are some uh, for the financial services industry uh, and we also have um, at Arma have industry uh, groups that you can join and there there is one uh, in financial services so you might want to check that out uh, I know that there's there's pretty good collaboration amongst uh, people within the same industry uh, Jen and Warren uh, do you do you have any thoughts on that. I know that we've often have uh, had customers or prospects uh, ask us about just sort of you know industry standard uh, mm -hmm. templates and, and so forth. And um, the idea always sounds good, but it's really difficult to nail down a you know a standard, so to speak, because every business is different <laughs> on mm -hmm. where you have operations, what kind of operations you have. Yeah. You know, are you mm -hmm. are you you know dealer broker? Are you a bank? Are you insurance right. company? You know, all of those different things will um, affect how you keep records and where you keep them and who has jurisdictions mm -hmm. and, and so on. And it's it's mm -hmm. certainly not, it's never one size fits all. It's a good maybe start off point. Right. Uh, right. And then you have to tailor it certainly to the, the specifics of your organization, including all of those other categories that have nothing to do with yeah. um, the specific requirements. And sometimes what happens is uh, when there is a, a template, uh, an attempt at a template in order to, um, to cover the legal aspects of that, you have to make the coverage so broad Mm -hmm. um, that you really have many more categories uh, than you than you want, and so mm -hmm. you still end up having to pare that down to just what's right. you know what's necessary. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I think that we. You know, I mean, we often get this question. We have clients asking for templates, and in some instances, you know, um, there's kind of a depending on the business. Yeah, there's a way I think there, but ultimately they all you know we always kind of work with them to really tailor it to their organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of where we always end up. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see, we're, we're, we're almost done with these questions. Wow. I, um, so does anyone know where I could find an example? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did that one. Sorry, I apologize. Um, if we have a retention requirement that runs counter to compelled destruction requirements, which takes precedence? Jen, do you have thoughts on that one? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, so one thing um, that we note in most of the compelled destruction requirements is they mm -hmm. have kind of a carve out 
for mm -hmm. other legal requirements. Um, right. Uh, for example, that Utah requirement I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a carve out for that, um, you know, same thing for the Illinois uh, biometrics, you know, like FINRA, for example, requires fingerprints to be retained for broker dealers for a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. you know, so that would be a carve out if it needs to be kept longer. So I think that's one thing we always look to first um, is to find, you know, is there kind of does it grant exceptions for other legal requirements and generally they do. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? I know from what I've seen, uh, sometimes those compelled destructions end up uh, breaking down some of the big buckets into little bit smaller buckets because mm -hmm. of those exceptions. Mm -hmm. so we have seen some of that as a trend. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Warren. And, you know, to that point, you know, more and more we're seeing biometric record series in client schedules because. Mm -hmm. It is highly sensitive personal information and it's being so strictly regulated and not only internationally, but now we're seeing more and more in the States too. So it really makes sense to kind of break that information out. Okay. All right. Um, here's the next one here. Should a retention program prioritize the deleting of documents after they have expired or prioritize the retaining of documents per their legal requirements. In other words, is there more risk of deleting too soon or keeping too long? Uh, and I, I think that's an, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's about striking the balance. I think it also really depends on the, the nature of the records, I think specifically that we're talking about. Jen, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that the safest bet is really to make sure you're following your policy mm -hmm. um, and that your policy is being refreshed on a periodic basis. Mm -hmm. Um, taking into account all of those legal requirements, as well as, um, you know, the business operational requirements of the business. And I think as long as you're really kind of on top of that and maintaining mm -hmm. your policy, really just stick to your policy as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would add that it kind of depends on what you're worried about. You know, are you more worried about what someone will find? Or are you worried about <laughs> what you might lose? <laughs> Right. I think, again, that goes to the, I think that really hits heavily on the sort of nature of the record you're talking about specifically. And obviously you want a policy that's developed around those specific mm -hmm. record yeah. types. So I think there's some that, I think there's some types of records that create more risk when they're over-retained uh, than others and, and vice versa, potentially. I think, so. you know, going back to the, um, the social media and text messages and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, and I would put email in that category too. That's one of those things where, um, especially like email, the trend, you know, years ago was just to, to keep it all just in case. Then mm -hmm. they realized that there were a lot of litigation uh, issues over that because it was mm -hmm. being used against them. And so now it's more like, okay, let's get rid of that as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. And some of that I think about just as a risk from a, a volume perspective, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you've hung on to this sort of potentially negligible value record for a longer period than you than you need to and then litigation hits and now you have to go through that uh, so yeah. it just can be voluminous and also depending on the media type too difficult to review and piece together uh, the conversation so I think we've I mean, we've evolved pretty well in, in email in putting together threads of a communication uh, and uh, you know streamlining that process but I don't think we've you know, integrated as well all of the newer modes of communication. So they're, they're difficult to get through if you have to. Um, this is our last question. Uh, with the collection of sensitive information, such as biometrics, in response to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, have organizations um, been forced to review their retention schedule to address privacy considerations? I'm just curious, too, if you, if you have any thoughts or comments on, on the retention of all of this, these new records that we're creating with regard to um, you know, to COVID. So every, you know, I think every place you go now, um, people are, you know, either asking for uh, a temp or doing a temperature check, uh, either asking to do some kind of questionnaire. Have you, you know, traveled here, been, you know, been exposed to X? And so upon entry to buildings, uh, any thoughts on, on um, one, the, the first part of this question, has it, has it forced people to review their retention schedules a little bit more carefully about those privacy considerations? And then any thoughts you might have on the retention of that information? Yeah, I can kind of speak to that. Um, we, you know, we started this virtual coffee series and it just kind of happened to, 
um, align with, you know, the start of the pandemic. And we mm -hmm. spent um, several series talking about COVID records. Right. Um, and I, I don't think in my RIM career, I've really had the opportunity to, um, you know, kind of look at or deal with something as substantial as this, where it's like, you know, um, introducing a completely kind of new type of almost like medical record or record to the retention schedule to this degree, mm -hmm. I guess. There's always things that come up, um, you know, with different laws, but it was definitely a sense of urgency surrounding mm -hmm. this. They're like, we're creating all these and collecting all these records. And I think that people were definitely um, mostly worried about it because of, of the privacy implications. So mm -hmm. they wanted to make sure they were getting it right. Um, mm -hmm. And there are definitely some nuances. We had these conversations about the records, you know, so for example, um, you know, taking COVID tests, um, you know, what, what type of record is this? Is it a medical record? And then we talked about the nuances. Well, if somebody is exposed while they're at the workplace and they have a test, to confirm an exposure or mm -hmm. disconfirm, then is that rise to the level of an OSHA exposure record because it is right. a biological agent. But you know, what if we have somebody who's been working off site for the past five months, now they want to return to work as part of their return to work, they have to you know, have a negative test. That's not really an exposure record, right? Because they mm -hmm. haven't been in the workplace. And so, I mean, the, the importance there is, you know, exposure records have a really long retention period. Isn't that, um, that's, that's very long, right? It's, yeah. isn't it, it's, it's, it's decades long after, is that, it's, it's, uh, okay. Right. Yeah, it's like a, um, 30 years or something. 30 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these, it, it really forced people to think, you know, really hard about it and, mm -hmm. you know, want to make sure that they were only keeping these records as long as necessary per mm -hmm. the legal requirements or other reasons and kind mm -hmm. of minimize that risk with over retention. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that has been really kind of fascinating and really kind of a test to how much um, organizations and people are thinking about privacy with mm -hmm. regard to the records they're, they're collecting and how, and how they're categorizing them in the retention schedule um, and making sure that they're not over retaining. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting. And we still get a lot of questions too. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're at the, the end of our questions. Does anyone have, does one of you have any um, final thoughts, last words before we end the recording? This has been a really interesting session. Uh, great questions. Um, really great to see all the participation. So uh, I've enjoyed mm -hmm. the process. And I just want to thank everyone again for coming. Any anybody else? Greg, Jen, uh, thank you so much for being here. Warren, thank you for being here. And uh, we'll get these questions out to everyone uh, really soon. Uh, and uh, stay safe, stay well. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.